can you hear me all great welcome to one of the very first and most exciting sessions of nestgen 22 with a focus on regulatory landscape this session would give you a deeper understanding on how to conduct pilotless bvlos flights while keeping safety in mind bvlos or beyond visual line of sight operations are still a distant dream for many due to the difficult waiver process that organizations need to go through the potential of drones for long range operations are still underutilized inspection of pipelines railway tracks highways and other similar assets that span thousands of kilometers are still yet to be normalized worry not to show you the way forward we have jackie the founder and ceo of hava uav or popularly called as the super women joining us today how are you we is an internationally recognized drone consultancy and system management company jackie and her team have been involved in various ground breaking projects such as conducting flight operations for the alphabet's wing drone delivery program managing several first bvlos flight approvals and implementing the first nsw shark surveillance flights She also implemented and oversaw the largest volunteer rollout of drone operations in Australia and invented a life-saving UAV shark alarm technology. Jackie knows flight regulations and procedures like nobody's business and can be an invaluable resource for anyone who wants to create a world-leading drone operation. Well, well when she is she isn't creating something interesting, her head is on the ground getting things moving. and making sure her kids get to school on time what's more jackie is a board member at v robotics double a us and safe skies australia she was also an nsw government business women of the year finalist optus business women of the year finalist and unmanned aerial system industry honoree <laughs> thank you and good morning good afternoon good evening and for all the others what are you doing up in the middle of the night um firstly thank you flight base team for such creating such an amazing event on a topic i believe is going to be a huge important part of the industry over the next few years um I also was so amazed in those uh, opening comments this morning there's so many people from the around the world so I am doing this live um and I do have a really bad habit of speaking really fast and also with my accent sometimes I'm hard to understand but I will really try to speak quite slowly for this presentation otherwise send me a little uh message to slow down so I've been in um involved in the drone industry now for the past 7 years when I first started it was all about proof of concepts trials and really seeing if the drone could actually be utilized to do the job that had been carried out in so many different ways previously we were hearing things like wow we didn't realize you could use a drone for that or wow we no longer need to get expensive scaffolding to get the inspection imagery required or wow this does really save time and has the potential for huge cost savings from there we saw many companies wanting to adapt drones into their workflows more permanently they started dipping their toes into pushing boundaries flying further or flying higher they began looking at organizational structures uh, introducing compliance software developing their staff and also looking at adding additional sensors and use cases to add to their programs from there over the last year we're now starting to see those organization have the defined use cases the experienced staff and are now ready to use drones in their organization and really see them explode and finally see those cost savings that we've been hearing about for many years drone in the box is an enabler of where organization would like to see their drone programs go It finally enables things like you know autonomous drone programs flying multiple drones at once more efficiency and those cost savings we also we are mostly seeing uh, the first drone in the box adapters from the mining industrial agriculture and security industries um and many more applications you'll hear from other nestian speakers over the course of the event um next slide So what am I here to talk about today? Um I'm going to discuss the regulatory process and considerations required for BV loss operations and remote and flying remotely from remote operation center. So let's start off with BV loss. What is it? So BV loss 
Oh, back a slide. Yep. BV loss is where you can fly further than you can see. I know some of the early keynote did explain that. For many, uh, for many years, the industry has been focused on visual line of sight where the pilot could be a few hundred metres from the drone, utilising radio frequency to control it. Many of the first BV loss flights were conducted with a visual observer. That visual observer was able to clear any of that air or ground risk or risk that the drone may cause. This, was, this is also called extended visual line of sight in many countries. With true BV loss, which we're going to speak about here today, it's when the air and the ground risk will be mitigated by other means other than the pilot or the observer clearing that risk. SORA is also a word up on my map. Um, it's also thrown out there quite a lot when discussing BV loss waivers or approvals. The SORA or the Specific Operation Risk Assessment was created by JARIS, which is the Joint Association for Rulemaking for Uncrewed Systems. It has been actually adapted by over 62 countries worldwide. Um, and from my experience, we do find that most regulatory authorities um, do put their own spin on the SORA, but the SORA is still the base. We also find that many countries, um, you might be watching and many of your countries may not utilise the SORA, we still find that those regulators use many of the same elements um, and require from the operator when developing their safety case for BV loss operations. So as well as BB loss, we're also going to discuss remote operations. Remote operations BB loss will be a really crucial part of successful drone in the box solutions to grow at scale. Remote operations is where a pilot is located in an entirely different uh, location from the drone. The pilot might be, like, uh, might be piloting one or more drone at a time and is connecting to the, either the drone or the vo box via LTE, 5G or satellite. Also, like many industries, I do actually flick between calling it a drone, a UAS, uncrewed aircraft, RPA. However, for this presentation, they all mean the same things. It's just, I don't know why, it just happens. Um, as you can see, the poll, um, I know that it's out. Um, so please uh, go into the poll and let me know who's flying visual line of sight. Let me know who's flying BV loss and who's not flying drones at all. Um, next slide. As Bashali mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of Hover UAV. Um, it was quite early on in a lot of our early trials that our team really fell in love with helping people move their drone programs forward. There were so many amazing entrepreneurs, inventors, early adapters, and we found the joy in helping them gain their complex operational approvals and making their products or programs a success. We also found there was a lot of confusion when people were discussing BV loss. We found people thinking it was going to be too expensive or unobtainable. So one of our proudest um, achievements has been that of the BV loss hub, which I'm sitting in tonight. Um, the BV loss hub is a place where people can come and learn about how to create the complex operational approvals or have one developed for them. It's a place for manufacturers to connect to end use cases and people requiring their products to assist in running safe BV loss operations. This could be from the drone, the box, the hardware or the software. It's also people can educate themselves and learn everything from running an emergency response plan, BV loss or how to manage compliance or just be a great chief remote pilot. Um, we often found that many organisations also needing to run a trial before full implementation. So we created a remote operations centre for drone operations. The remote operations centre is fully equipped with all the required connectivity and communication set up that is suitable for, suitable for most BV loss operations. Next slide. The BB Loss Hub has really allowed us to be an, um, an important part of so many amazing projects, from working with drone in the box providers such as Percepto and our remote operations centre to obtain one of the first BV loss remote operation approvals. We have conducted flight operations and ground support for the last four years for wing aviation delivery in Australia and uh, sometimes in Finland. We were lucky to utilise our SCORA and BV loss skills also to assist the Australian regulator create five BV loss standard scenarios for industry as well as an easy to use applicant and regulatory inspector checklist. Uh, we also have been able to connect client products to end use cases and then obtain long range BV loss flight approvals for medical, drone delivery, power line inspections and also coastal marine surveillance. 
So as we move on to the considerations for BB loss and the nitty gritty, unfortunately, this presentation, I'm not going to be able to solve everyone's problems from around the world or for issues for BB loss. BB loss risk levels can be from a very low, um, which could be flying for agriculture over fields or high risk for flying during delivery in the middle of a city. Um, so most of my examples and things we'll go through today are from low to medium risk. For a lot of the high risk uh, jobs, many of the regulators are still trying to lock in the best way to assess, assess those applications. They're also looking at what, um, what are the elements required and what are the elements required to be third party assessed. Um, we also believe the use cases we provided will be where a lot of people will fall for their first thrown in the box um, BV loss flights. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so BV loss considerations. Now, I know not everyone likes talking about risk like, <laughs> like me, so I will try to move through this fairly quickly, but unfortunately, I can't talk about the regulatory process without explaining a little bit about the risk. So bear with me for the next two minutes, and I promise it will get super exciting after that. <laughs> um, as mentioned earlier, we are, you, I'm probably more used to using the SORA methodology. However, even if your respective aviation authority does not, it does use a similar pathway. It uses a risk-based assessment or, you know what, some people call it a bowtie risk assessment, and it's used to evaluate the risk related to a given operation. The model usually considers all natures of the threats associated with a specific hazard, um, the relevant design and the proposed operational mitigations for that specific operation. What the SOAR methodology does and why it's been so widely adapted, it then helps evaluate the risks systematically and determine the boundaries required for safe operation. The method also allows the operator to then determine the acceptable risks and to validate that those levels are complied with for the proposed operation. Um, it still is based from a bowtie diagram. So a bowtie diagram visualises the risks that you are dealing with in one understandable picture. The diagram is shaped like a bowtie, creating a clear differential between the proactive and reactive side of risk management. The bowtie diagram provides you an overview of multiple plausible incident scenarios and then shows you what barriers you have to place to control those scenarios. So barriers are also referred to as controls or safety measures or, you know, layers of protective um, to control an unwanted situation or that, you know, that top event. Um, barriers in the bow tie on both sides of the top event. The barriers on the left side interpret the scenario so the threats do not occur and if they do not result in loss of control, which is that top event. Barriers on the right side make sure the scenario does not escalate into an actual impact, the consequence, and or they mitigate the actual impact. There are different types of barriers. I promise I'll, I'll get through the risk <laughs> really quickly, um, which are mainly a combination of human behaviour and or hardware and technology. You know, once the barriers are identified, you have a basic understanding of how you're going to manage your risks. You can build on this basic barrier structure further to deepen your understanding of where your strengths and where your weaknesses are. Barriers can be classified and assessed beside the barrier types to include, for instance, um, like, you know, the barrier effectiveness. Um, this lets you then assess how well your barrier will perform or is expected to perform based on the available data or you're relying on an expert judgment. After that, you can look at the activities you have specifically to implement to maintain those barriers. This essentially means, um, you know, mapping your safety management system into onto the barriers. Um, in addition, you can determine who is responsible for those barriers and assess the critical of the barrier in the context of other related information. Ultimately, you're linking and visualising all this information on the barrier and it gives you a holistic overview of the safety measures with relevant metadata in the context of your risk scenario. So to build your risk assessment safety case, one of the most important things we always discuss with our clients is really having a defined concept of operation. 
you know what, we need to provide the relevant technical, operational system information um, needed to assess the risks associated with the intended operation. We usually run like quick workshops to clients to really confirm if their concept of operation is actually feasible within their respective countries or regulatory framework, um, or their concept of operations need to be slightly amended. What we would look for in that concept of operation, um, we would look for operational characteristics. So some of them may be, you know, the overflow area. Is it sparsely populated? Is it an urban or is it a controlled environment? We look at the vertical or horizontal flight limits. We would look at the airspace classes. Is it controlled or uncontrolled? We'd look at the C2 limitations, like is there buildings or mountains that are going to obstruct the radio frequency or is there LTE connectivity? Or maybe we should be using satellite communications. We look at the weather limitation. Do we actually need to fly in rain or a hot climate? Um, and we also look at what human intervention or what autonomous drone flight is actually needed for that, that, um, that job that you're going to be doing. We'd also look at the, you as the operator. We would look at is everyone trained and hold appropriate licensing? We would look at the operator if they rely on any external services like, you know, LTE is probably the, the most popular one, like, um, or the internet services, they would need to be able to demonstrate that that performance and the availability of that service is adequate for their operations that they're proposing as well. The concept of operations should also include technical provisions such as uh, flight software, um, some of the components which I'm going to really go through the flight software thing because we're going to learn a lot about that from, from flight base during our these presentations as well. But some of the uh, things we would be looking for that we need to ensure that we could do would be, we need to be able to make sure we could find out the drone position, the height, altitude, ground speed, um, airspeed and tracking are all monitored. We need to know the RPA position reference um, and how it's going to avoid any you know, high risk areas or dwellings. We'd need to know how that the, it's going to manage the drone height in reference to the terrain, we need to look at the battery or whatever energy you are using to fly that and see how much it has left. Um, we also need to, you know, the status of the critical functions like the radio frequency or, you know, the GNSS, like we need to know those um, critical functions and they possibly could trigger an alert if the level is below the, um, the operator threshold as well. So we're going to use a case study. So we get a lot of phone calls during the week. So this is sort of a popular one that um, people want to implement for drone in the boxes quite early on. So the use case um, is, you know, a utility company. They're wanting to run 24 hours operations, monitoring site security, site hazards and inspecting assets. They're wanting to use a commercial drone and a commercial box. Because of COVID, they've now restricted all their personnel um, to being on site. So they would like all the pilots to be located offside remotely. The flights are going to go for 30 minutes um, and they're going to run on the hour. Um, they're using these off the shelf drones. They're going to be using lithium polymer for our example. As most of the uh, most of this is for inspections, um, we're going to have the flights operating within a hundred foot. Oh, uh, go back slide. Sorry, you jumped the one ahead. Yeah, just a long slide. <laughs> um, so we're going to have them flying within 100 foot of that structure um, vertically, um, and it's going to be a fairly low level flight as well. Um, the use case is going to be in sparsely populated. However, we're going to talk about this. We're going to actually, for this area, it's a utility site, we're going to actually classify it um, to the regulatory authority as saying it's a controlled environment. So even if it was near a more populated um, area around that, we could probably get this one through as well. Um, what the controlled area is, um, look, it's a utility site. So for this scenario, it's gonna be fenced. Um, it's, it's already restricting the general public from entering. It has entry control, it has security cameras. Um, also for this use case, the airspace is in class G airspace, uncontrolled airspace. The drones themselves are commercially off the shelf, which is sort of what a lot of the products that you're going to hear about in the next few days are. Um, they have an optical camera and a thermal capabilities, which will be great for the utility inspection. The drones are fairly automated. However, they do still require some human intervention for the CONOPS. Um, and the main two options for the 
options for flying the drone for the C2 links, which is command and control, we're seeing is either that the pilot is connected to the base station via like LTE, and then the, then the, it is operating the drone via radio frequency. Um, the other option, which is sort of my preference <laughs> because it is easier to get through, um, is the drone might have dual SIM cards or options and can be controlled directly from the remote pilot. Um, and also they have a secondary channel as a redundancy as well. Um, the box they provoke, um, the box we provoke, have proposed, um, although an individual unit needs, it was specifically made for this commercial off the shelf drone. Um, the scenario for the concept of operation, uh, the, you know, the utility company have been doing similar flights for the past year, um, so they hold all the relevant licenses and procedures and training will also be provided. Um, we're going to go through procedures a little bit later on. There are great options for con flight control software out there, and there's some also not so good ones. Um, it's important to do your due diligence. Um, we are, for this scenario, we're going to be using the flight-based software um, for this scenario. So developing, that was our con concept of operations. A lot involved, but that's all the things you've got to do to make sure it's going to be a feasible prop. Um, like program. Uh, developing a concept of operation is an ever changing. So as we continue down the risk process, additional mitigations or limitations may be identified requiring a, um, like a, additional associated technical details or procedures. Um, so we might have to then update that concept of operations as well. Now we have a clear defined concept of operation. You would look at the risk to the air and the ground risk. And look if there's any way that you can lower or you actually, if you need to lower the risk any further. The ground risk looks at um, a person being struck by the, struck by the drone um, in case of loss of the drone control. So we would look at the characteristics of the drone, uh, like, you know what, like what is the typical kinetic energy at impact? And also we would look at the intended area of operation. The operational volume is determined in of like a 4D space. So the latitude, longitude, height, and time. In particular, we would also look at the accuracy of navigation solutions, um, flight technical errors um, of the drone and the path definition error as well. Latencies should also be considered and addressed in this determination. You would need to look if the area is sparsely populated or you know, populated every country, unfortunately, has a little bit different of a different um, a definition of what they all are between controlled, sparsely populated and populous. Um, but the, the, as I mentioned, the controlled ground environment is quite a good one um, because it, it usually, if you can claim that, it is a lower risk level than because there's no general public can enter into that area. We then, some mitigations, you might want to start putting some uh, mitigations into your into your risk SOAR or safety case, if you want to call it. Um, some of the ones that I know that the regulators have been accepting are one-to-one -one buffer for your operational area from dwellings or places of higher risk. What this means, if, if your flight is 120 metres, you would need 120 metres buffer from the edge of your operational and contingency areas. We also have seen some great options for claiming lower population density through industrial estates at night or residential areas um, during the day. You might also look at reducing the risk, um, reduce the effect of you know, impact dynamics. An example could be parachutes, which I know someone's talking about a little bit later in the regulatory section. Um, another example could be like a power lift aircraft, but not only with that power source, um, you know, has, has the, uh, of the rotors has a redundancy as well. Um, for the scenario, we have already decided that it's a controlled environment um, and we are going to use a one-to-one -one buffer to lower that risk. Let's look at, go to the air. Let's look at the air risk. Um, for the air risk, we would usually look at the intrinsic risk uh, of a mid-air collision and also the chance, and also the chance of encountering air traffic. We would be characterised by categories, you know, like altitude, controlled versus uncontrolled, he, um, airport, heliport versus non-airport, heliport environments, urban versus rural, etc. We would also look at ways then um, of applying strategic or tactical mitigations to lower that risk. 
An example of strategic mitigation, um, you know, could be by operating times um, or, you know, within certain boundaries. We could use common structures for rules, um, like examples of this, which is usually quite common around the world, are VHF radio calls, no TAMs, or conforming to airway restrictions. After applying those strategic uh, first mitigations of any residual risk of the mid-air collision um, is usually addressed by tactical mitigations. So tactical mitigation, which include both the tactical process of a separation provision and the collision avoidance. So tactical mitigations take form of detect and avoid systems or alternate means such as like ADSB or UTM or use based services or operational procedures. Um, depending on that residual risk for mid-air collision, the tactical mitigations may vary of what is actually required. Um, for this scenario, we're going to fly in class G airspace. There's no adjacent risk um, like controls. Um, how, oh, however, a lot of the areas um, are flying the uncontrolled aerodrome, so we're going to leave that one in. But as you may have mentioned in my concept of operations, we actually said that we were going to fly within 100 foot of a structure. Many countries from around the world uh, allow you to utilise something called atypical airspace. There's a few different meanings of what that means, but one of the ones, like, like for example, in Australia, atypical airspace, one of the things we can utilise is if you're flying within 100 foot of a structure or 120 metres laterally from that object, you can actually claim that it's very unlikely that there will be air traffic in that area, so it's atypical airspace, which is a very low-risk um, environment. So we then would look... Still look, if we wanted to look at how far possible we could lower to further any further mitigations, we could add those, um, we're going to add our strategic mitigations, we're going to do radio calls, um, and no TAMs will also be raised for our job, um, and we're going to use ADSB for our tactical mitigations. So, conscious of time. Other, look, I'll go through the last few really quickly. Other considerations for BV loss where RP has technical issues. So, we would look at your proposed training, procedures, maintenance programs, deep dive into the command and control and communication links. Um, I'm going to bring that up all through this presentation multiple times because it's such an important component for remote operations BV loss. We're going to look at the external systems, evaluate. Um, and look at things that you cannot control. That, that's what we've sort of just spoken about, GPS or, or internet. We look at human factors. Our case study, we're going to fly for 24 hours. We look, how are you going to manage fatigue? Um, we also look at HMI, which is the human machine interface, um, the system setups, the displays, the handover, takeover, multiple crew coordination. Uh, and also it's always the procedures and training implemented. <laughs> We would look at adverse operating conditions, so operating within an environmental considerations. Um, can the crew actually identify what operation will be out of their limits and what procedures and training outline this in your documentation as well? Next slide, finally. <laughs> so remote operation considerations. As most this conference and also our use case is flying from highly auto automated systems and drone in the box solution. Let's look at some of those additional requirements we need to consider on top of, or just, you know, it's an enhanced view of some of the ones we talked about in the last slide for creating that safety case we're going to need. One of the first things, once again, I'm going to say it, is we really need to look at how we command and control the aircraft, um, the C2 or C3 links. Um, like how are you going to actually fly that? We need to look at the latency of the connection from where the pilot inputs the commands to when that aircraft responds. Um, for some of the low to mid risk that we're talking about in this scenario, we have been able to provide like telecommunication data coverage maps or view shed analysis um, and the HMI assessments, um, which we're going to discuss shortly, um, will suffice. However, as that risk level goes higher, other options of just determining the connection um, will also be required to be provided. We discussed in previous slides, as we looked at the air on the ground risk consideration, additional thought was placed into some of those mitigations that we placed um, or may be a requirement from your regulator. One of the biggest challenges 
well, I didn't think it was going to be, but it ended up being a long sort of process, was we actually, it was how do we communicate with the VHF um, air traffic? So th there are some off-the-shelf radio over IP options. However, basically, that's just a relay system. So you can, you can hear what they're saying and you can repeat. These options were not going to work for us. Um, mostly due to the fact that the regulator requires you to be able to control the radio, check it works, check squelch, listen and scan on multiple channel, um, channels because you may want to actually have multiple drones up at the one time in different geographical areas. So we ended up working with a communication specialist to create comms in a box, which is a portable system for uh, VHF communications and ADSB. It has all the required site equipment and antennas in a portable weatherproof box and all associated systems for that remote operations centre. Um, we also found, look, and hopefully this, some of this stuff we can change as time goes on, but sometimes you've just got to do it to start with until the regulators build up more confidence in the, in the systems, processes and procedures. We found that they like us to install a site camera at the moment at the location to assist with being able to clear that air and ground risk when we are leaving. Um, and also to pick up some items that maybe you're used to doing on your pre-flight checks similar to when you're doing visual line of sight flights. Hardware, obviously some straightforward ones you're going to require for, for this, a drone and maybe a box. Um, however, look, you want to make sure that there's a large enough areas where you can have flat, maybe some concrete on it so the water flows off. We want to add some extra signage or, you know, fence to where the actual base station is located. Um, we're not going to be on site, so we probably need to install a weather station. We need the comms in the box, power supplies, UPS, um, definitely good internet connectivity. Sometimes that might need some independent networking as well. We would be required to make sure all of these solutions um, are suitable for HMI assessment um, and also if there's required maintenance on all the components. This is also, as I said, it was sort of weird, two of the things that, you know, uh, for our first one came back and forward with the regulators quite a lot. Um, and we also need to make sure that most companies are aware of this. For so many years, people have been conducting VLOS, EVLOS or BVLOS flights from where the actual location the drone is launching from. This allowed them to complete that visual pre-flight inspection as part of the maintenance program. But however, as they are now flying from a remote location, that it, this can't always be done. So we also found the one thing that was a little bit difficult, that a lot of the OEM or the manufacturer manuals still say a visual inspection is required. Um, so we need to come up with ways where we can do that pre-flight check if it's, as I said, by utilising camera or, you know, trying to get them to, to remove that or doing um, a lot of the systems and software does automated checks as well. The software, um, we still would probably utilise someone on site to do a visual inspection, you know, it might be monthly or whatever your regulator feels um, happy in providing and we would still need to send someone out to do the manufacturer maintenance level if it's 100 hours or 500 hours or whatever is stated and recommended by those manufacturers of both the box and all the associated equipment, the drone and every other piece of equipment. Um, the software is crucial. I'm not going to talk a lot about this because you're going to hear a lot about it over the next few presentations, but it is quite, quite, it's probably one of the most important components because it's where we actually get all of the information we need to write those procedures and those emergency procedures as well, which we're going to talk about shortly. Along with the risk assessment, which we've just spoken about for a while, um, there's other associated things that a regulator are going to want you to show, to, to see. So go to the next slide. This one is just, look, it's a KML. You want to, you want to be able to show them, like, so they can have a really clear visual idea of what um, and where you're flying. Look, this one doesn't actually match. Sorry, it doesn't actually match the use case. But, you know, you want to put things on, like the range of the C2 links, the flight paths, vertical limits. If you're using a one-to-one -one buffer or contingency areas, you would, you'd highlight that around your operational area, alternate landing sites, and any associated airspace. Uh, next slide. So we have addressed many items in the risk assessment that the procedures of how you are actually going to do this and manage a flight is a crucial requirement. So from normal procedures to your emergency procedures, the steps you are going to follow or the expected outcomes of your flight control software will follow 
if an issue occurs. So you need to include things in your normal procedures like, you know, flight planning, assembly, pre-flight launch, the actual operations, recovery, post-flight, um, emergency procedures. Um, there's, you know, everything from degradation of your C2 links, um, flyaway, termination, lock of, loss of VHF communications, and, and many more that I've um, stated there as well. So the one thing what we really need, <laughs> and it's the first thing I ask people when they call is, are you working with people that have good manuals? It's really great. Um, so for this use case scenario, for example, I want a drone operation manual for that drone. I want a drone maintenance manual if they've got one. I want a comes in the box user guide. I want the flight based software user manual. I want the box hardware user manual and any other additional user manual because we that's where we can get a lot of the information to create those procedures which form a huge part of your safety case to your regulator. So we're going to go to the next slide. Um, HMI, this one sort of actually is pretty exciting to, <laughs> to me as one of my favourite elements. Um, and it means you're actually up to like, you know, you're up to the operational checks um, and making sure that everything you've written in your safety case actually works as it should. So the HMI looks at everything from how your station is set up. Is the lighting adequate? The environment suitable? Can the VHF radio be heard? Um, it needs to be very clearly labelled and easy to understand. Um, is the software manageable? Can the interface of the software be like simple and clear for the pilot? Is the latency bandwidth for the flight as expected? We would look this little diagram of like a very basic operation center. It doesn't all have to have, um, you know, a super high tech one like the NASA control room. However, it would be pretty cool. But you can do start with something pretty simple like what I've got in the diagram. So having two screens, you might have your flight operational software on one. You might have some weather, your ADSB and your radios um, on some of the other monitors as well. Usually we always have to have a UPS or backup power. We modems. Um, and backup modem as well I used to use. We usually, when we set up remote ops, uh, try to get um, fibre or additional lines so we don't have any issues with bandwidth um, as well. Headphones, emergency response phone, um, and obviously the normal things like lighting chairs, table, <laughs> um, and, you know, extra charts and, and ursas and things like that. So on the site, it's the same. Things need to be clear and easy to understand. Um, you would have, the, the, you know, all the things we've talked about, the drone, the box, the internet, the comms in a box, the routers, power supplies, signage, camera, weather stations. Um, we'd also probably put an air con unit, especially if you're flying in Australia, super hot, you need to keep keep every temperature cold, or um, in often some areas where I see people on, it's super cold, <laughs> so they might want to keep things warmer. Uh, flicking to the next slide. The emergency response plan, um, you sort of need this for this, and it's created if that top, you know, that top bow tie risk assessment, the loss of control of the operations. Um, these are the emergency situations where the operation is unrecoverable. Um, so it could not be handed by any of those contingency or the emergency procedures we would have created in the procedures. The um, so in this scenario, we're operating from the remote operations center, so we would need to make sure that um, we would have someone on that site or near that site that could respond if there's an emergency. As I said, I might be located on the other side of the country, um, so we do need to rely on the site person to be that person and to, we need to have communication with them. So they need to be, if the drone lands, um, we'd make sure they're trained up on how to deal with a LiPo fire and things like that as well. The last slides we'll finish up with, because I know I'm getting on the time. Let me just quickly check. Um, so one to many. So one to many is, and I know we've mentioned it throughout the presentation. So what is it? It's going to be a crucial part of BV loss operations, um, and it's pretty well the step before full autonomy. It's where one pilot can fly multiple drones at the same times. Um, the drones don't need to be in the same location, although that often when we start, it's like that crawl walk run. You might want to start with them at the same location and then move out. Um, we are seeing a big trend in Australia at the moment with flying multiple drones at once. So, you know, it might be a few for agriculture or 15 to 20 for drone delivery. The HMI is a, a crucial part to one-to-many operations. So, you know what, if, if your software 
doesn't allow you, you can't have 10 monitors monitoring 10 drones or 10 controllers. So you need to make sure that software has that HMI and it's all accessible and manageable. Look, also, when you start moving up in the higher numbers and flying multiple, it's more about managing non-conformities more than actually individually flying that RPA. So you need that software to be able to tell you when it is not non when it is not conforming to what the program you have set. So what's next? Um, next slide. So what's next? As mentioned, we only went through the pathways required for low to medium risks. However, as the use cases expand, the technology advances and the regu regulatory authorities are further going to define the requirements. We're going to see certain elements we're going to need to further scale large scale drone the box operations. These include a UTM, like an uncrewed or a low level traffic management, certifications of RPAs or detect and avoid standards, and also integrated systems for managing not just managing like flying drones, but, you know, maritime and terrestrial drones as well. Um, and a lot of these items are actually going to be covered by other speakers um, coming up this evening or morning, wherever you are. Um, so now we're going to move to questions. Um, and also, look, I'd love to hear about any exciting projects um, and if we can help any organisations move forward or you're interested in the BB Loss Hub. Um, look, please, if you don't get to ask your questions now, uh, please come through to me. I'd love to love to talk further. Thank you. So I'd like to Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Start a few minutes. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, yes, we are we we are exactly on time. Uh, so again, thank you for sharing all these insights with us. I'm sure it's going to benefit the entire audience that's keen to conduct BVLS operations. That's going to be the next big thing, uh, if it's not already. <laughs> and thank you again. Uh, thank you again for showing us the risks with specific scenarios. That 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 was an amazing. Uh, 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 we, we we got to learn a lot from it. Uh, okay, Jackie okay, also spoke next about slide. the chips. Do you just go to the next slide so people can grab my details if they need? Perfect. Yes, yes, yeah. correct, correct. So I've got a lot of questions. I'll jump right to it. If any okay. of you have any questions, please type in to in the Q and A tab. Uh, okay. So the first one is um, how. Okay, I, I'm just trying to pick up one. Do you see an increasing opposition to ADSB out among regulators considered uh, considering the potential safety implications to manned aircrafts? Um, look, yeah, I do see implementation, and I'm not sure it's going to be the best way forward. Um, it'll be interesting to see how you know other companies sort of even move forward with, with other options and 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 the UTM pathways as well. Interesting. All right. <laughs> Thank you. And what do you think? How has your experience been? You shared a, a use case, or uh, you've gotten permissions uh, for drone in a box units. How has the experience been about getting permissions from CASA, especially? Uh, was that a very difficult process? Was that simple enough? Uh, will yeah. the people be able to get that easily? Yeah. Look, the first one's always harder um, because obviously the regulatory authority don't have all the pathways. So usually the people like us that end up getting grey hairs from doing that first um, make the pathway a lot easier for the second and third and fourth. Look, if you've got really your concept and all your information provided, it, it can be done. Um, look, I do, I do re think you should, like people should reach out and speak to people that really focus on those approvals. Um, it really can save you a lot of time. Um, because, yeah, there, there is a lot involved with what's required, but they're very open to it. We're starting to see many push through. Um, we're also starting to see drone in the box utilised by EVLOS as a sort of a first start as well for EVLOS class two, the ones that are from CASA that might, might understand that, that process. So that's a great way to join in while you're waiting for your BVLOS approvals. Great. And uh, do you think there's a list or you've already shared a basic checklist for drones and docking station uh, to be compliant for CASA? Uh, maybe there's a quick checklist that people can, you know, just go and uh, have a look at. Um, look, I do, and I probably should put, should share something out over the coming weeks. We do sort of have a, have a checklist. Um, it's usually like all, all the different elements are listed in sort of some estimates we put out what it's going to cost for to set your own remote operations centre. But it, yeah, we can do the hardware checklist, but there's also the, the regulatory checklist to make sure that your concept of operations and all of those external options are um, suited as well. Uh, one question that Jackie is uh, out there, how long does it take to get these approvals? Like what is the typical waiting period or, uh, yeah, Depends on what country you're from. 
Depends on what country you're from and I guess the, the priority list and how, how they organise that. But look, um, look, I'll, I'll give the Australian and then maybe I'll, I'll do a comparison with like CAA in New Zealand or something like that. Um, for BV loss operations in Australia, it's usually between, they, they like to say three months, but I'm seeing it's more between three and six months. Um, so that's what we would sort of say at the moment. Three months would be really good. As long as all your paperwork, if, if, they, if the regulator, it doesn't matter what part of the world, if the regulator has to keep coming back and forward, it can draw it out for a year or two years. Um, so it's really understanding, having all that documentation, having all your procedures and everything written, and then, then that's almost like a pleasure for them to read and they can, they can go through it and move through quite quickly. But, yeah, three, three to six months is what we're seeing. Um, sometimes uh, in other countries I'm seeing it a little bit longer. Um, it's probably because Australia has already done sort of, you know, I think they're up to about 300-plus BV loss approvals at the moment. So they're, they're getting sort of systems in place and they introduce the standard scenarios, which is really good as well. Did you say 300-plus? That, that's a great exactly. number to start with. Yes. Yeah, brilliant. I think we are all, almost up on time. Uh, I uh, I mean, we are already over time. So again, thank you, Jackie, <laughs> for answering all these questions. Uh, and uh, let, let's hope to see more VVLS operations. And, and thank you for showing the path for adoption. Uh, would you like to share some closing thoughts before we uh, close for the <laughs> session? <laughs> No, I, I I don't know anything. But don't give up. It's 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 so. We need to keep pushing those boundaries. We need to, to just do it. And if you break it down into small sections, it, it can be achieved. Um, it's not. Don't expect the regulator to give you all the answers. Um, it's a learning curve for everyone, including them. So it's always you really have to explain what you're doing um, and help them understand as well because. It, it, a lot of this stuff that we're all doing is new to everyone. So don't expect them to be able to tell you every every answer. All right. Uh, again, uh, thanks, everyone. I, I've also uh, posted the poll result, Jackie. We completely missed that mm -hmm. out. So around, uh, if you just go to the polls tab, you can see almost 53% of uh, the audience is using uh, conducting drone operations currently in within the line of sight, 39% are trying out BVLS, which is a huge number and percentage, in my opinion, and 9.7% uh, is still trying uh, to figure out how to use drones, which is, again, a great thing. Uh, so let's hope um, if you have, if you want to share something about the results. No, perfect. No, that, that, I couldn't actually find where they were on my screen, so I'm glad you brought, brought them up. Okay. Oh, uh, all right. Uh, so, uh, great. Uh, for all so the much. audience joining us today, thank you again. Uh, yes, thank you, Jackie, you were saying something. No, I said thank you so much. It's great to, great to be on and I'm probably going to go to bed soon, so I'm going to have to watch back all everyone else's presentation um, in, no. uh, when you release them. Jackie's coordinates are up on the slides for anybody who would want to reach out to Jackie. We also have a booth of Hover UV, so feel free to go there during the booth visits and just register interest. Jackie is going to receive an email and uh, you can uh, you know, uh, talk uh, or communicate with them. Uh, we have uh, three, uh, we have a, in the next few minutes, we are coming up with networking sessions. So you can just hop on to the sessions window create a round table on the topic of your choice or join one of the existing uh, or exciting discussions on popular topics. We have for topics such as public safety, security operations, uh, regulations, inspections. So just feel free to join in one of these sessions or you can create one of your own depending on the topic of your choice and just communicate with the, the entire community that, that we are trying to build. So thank you again for joining us. Have a great day and have a great time at NestGen. See you in the next sessions.